minutes or whatever. I think half the study days ago, you know, the brain can absorb about 50 percent. But let me start off by showing how crude that can be, um, which is, I had another one, which is the brain can absorb what the rear can tolerate. So that's probably less than 15 minutes. So, you know, if, if you start nodding off, then I'll shut up. Um, uh, my business partner in UK knows I'm bipolar, in Dubai knows I'm bipolar, everybody knows I'm bipolar. Um, uh, so he said, are you nervous about it? And I said, not a bit. He said, you must be nervous. I said, no, the big problem for me is not what I'm going to say, because I'll just <laughs> ramble on and I don't care anymore uh, what people think. The big problem for me is what mood I'm going to be in. Literally, you know, I don't know what mood I'm going to be in. So uh, I could come here and if I was hyper, you wouldn't be able to understand anything I say, because my words literally a little bit of and uh, I miss, miss everything up. Or if I'm depressed, I wouldn't turn up at all. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I have to open this sort of seesaw I'm on, which is literally uh, trying to find the middle as I'm sliding down. So I'm, I'm, the good news is I'm sort of in the middle, slightly higher, you know. Um, <laughs> so I, try, I, I can't cover everything off tonight. I, I'm happy for people to ask questions whenever they like, but the problem is I'm like Ronnie Corbett, I'll forget where I am, so um, I can tell you what I was wearing in 1973 on a particular day, I kid you not, um, I've got that sort of memory, um, it's terrifying, um, but equally if I start rambling I'll forget what I said three minutes ago, so it's like I'm suffering from early dementia in that sense, a sort of bipolar dementia, so, um, or I'll take any questions you want, anything you want to ask about it, however personal, um, I, I'll open up quite a few things today, so you realise, you know, I have nothing bashful about it at all. You know, my attitude is to buy a poem now, okay? <laughs> I've got it, and, uh, you know, it, it, I, I, I'm making some money out of it now. Yes. It's taken to us 59 to work out, you know what, this bastard's going to actually pay my bills from now on. I'm going to write about it. Um, anybody who's read my blogs, they probably haven't. That's a plug, go on my website and read my blogs. But I did one recently that people like, and it was it's called The Turning Point. Did I see the white light? You know the white light when you think you've snuffed it? Um, and the second time I tried suicide, I really went for it. I went for it the first time, but I, I, like Stephen Fry, um, I took, uh, I walked to uh, the bottom of, uh, do you know Horse Water in the Lake District? Mm -hmm. I walked all the way around Horse Water, found somewhere uh, quiet, and got the whiskey out and the pills and shoved them all in. And I lay there and I looked, and there was an eagle, it's an eagle in the Lake District up there. And I thought, you know what? Maybe I should lie in my stomach, because that bugger will come down and peck my eyes out. And out. <laughs> what a bizarre thing to think, you know, as if you can. It's a bit like my mother used to say, now, have you got clean underwear on when I was six? <laughs> you know, why, why do I need that? In case you get an order. <laughs> and I'm rambling already, but, you know, my mother, um, father probably had it. My grandmother came from a family where she'd say, it's ten pence in a shilling. You know, ten pence in a shilling, that's what it used to be called. Now it's fruitcake, fruit loop, fruit, whatever. Um, but I came from Lancashire where the default position, probably like Yorkshire as well, is you know, pull yourself together. And I've already forgotten, oh yeah, I'm back to the white light, okay, so, um, second time I thought, uh, being a coward, you know, I'm not somebody to get a ligature or anything like that, and I'm not mocking it, but you know, I wanted a painless way out, so uh, the car seemed to be a good option. The fact was I had a TVR, which is not really the quietest car to put in the garage. Um, spectacular way to go, you know, it was a red line green chimera, if you know them, but this thing rumbled, and the neighbour obviously heard, and the next thing is I'm in hospital, but I don't know anything about it. And the doctor said, as it turned out, it was about 15 minutes away with a blood count of, of actually achieving my goal. And uh, what led to the book, uh, and me finally getting to grips with bipolar in a way was, was that moment because I thought as I sat there waiting for the moment and I could feel myself, you know, woo, uh, that I thought, I wonder if I'll see the white light, if I'll be dragged through, you know, like something like a poltergeist and so on, all these sort of fantasies that you might have and then thinking, bloody hell, but the white light that is probably not going to be the white light. It's going to be a dreadful smell and flames, you know, and all sorts of things down there. So, and then I went. The problem was there was a white light. A very fierce white light, but as it turned out, it was the doctor's pen shining into my pupils as I came round. And unfortunately for me, as I came round, as you would at that point, thinking maybe I'd landed in heaven, unfortunately for me, he was a Sikh, and he had a white turban on. And yes, I actually said, is that you, God? Um, which, um, <laughs> which, yeah, exactly, yeah, I can laugh about it now. At the time, you know, I was crying, I was in the state, and uh, 
Okay, and I remember him saying, <laughs> no, it's Dr. Singh. <laughs> <laughs> Which didn't really register, and I went through about a week and being very angry with my neighbour. I was very hostile with my neighbour for rescuing me, which was pretty unpalatable of me to do, but I was really angry with her. I made up later because she was the one who pulled me out. But it was my best friend, and I, said, I went to recuperate with him, and I told him the white light story, very serious and still very upset. And I can still see his face. Where have you ever tried to stifle a laugh? And the mucus almost started to come out of his nose. He was straining that hard, and his eyes crossed, and eventually just convulsed. And I started laughing and, and started to realise how preposterous the whole damn thing was. Um, and that's when I sort of pretty much wrote the book. Uh, I didn't write it with any sort of intention of doing good or, you know, he did it so that others may live or any kind of altruism. I don't even know why I wrote it. I like writing. Um, I think the bipolar makes you quite creative. Um, uh, I thought I was funny. And so I, my byline is God made me bipolar, but he also made me funny. Um, uh, I do my own scripts that way. Not I, just, you know, I laugh at my own jokes, Peter. Um, so uh, that's really quite sad that you tell jokes and you laugh at them yourself. Um, where did it start? My bipolar probably started, I call it my bipolar. And the difference, I've said to Louise today, is I don't know where my personality starts and ends and the bipolar starts and ends. Um, what bits are bipolar, what bits I'm just being cute and crafty, if I'm being honest. I can manipulate like anyone else and hide behind bipolar. So if you've got children or partners or whatever, they can be cute too. Um, so you can be being conned. Um, uh, right now I'm thinking, my God, I'm good at this. <laughs> okay, standing here. That's how good it makes you feel. If you get in the right mood, you feel you can be master of the universe. If I get a bad hyper thing, if I'm lying in bed, I, my eyelashes feel like thunder, you know, from the, the heightened senses. Um, when I was with a psychiatrist once, he said, what are you doing? And I was talking to him. I said, I'm counting the bricks on the wall outside. He said, you winding me up. I said, no, I'm not. There's 131. And there were. And I was talking to him while I was counting. That's how, sort of, heightened you can get with it. So you feel literally, in that moment, omnipotent. That you can fly. That you can do anything. And then suddenly, just like coming off a cliff, I don't know what it is, what switches it off. Next minute I feel utterly incapable. I, you know, I can barely breathe, I can't think. And I, just, I made a, a blog last week which is called The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. If you read the Yorkshire Times, it was in there. I said I've made a startling discovery. I'm tripolar. It's a new discovery, because apart from being um, the good, which is the hyper bit, and the bad, which is the depression, I'm also a complete bastard. <laughs> Seriously, I am, because I have um, modern media helps that, because of SMSs and emails, things that weren't available to me before. When I get hurt by a lady, usually, um, I've usually had some bad experiences with ladies. Probably my fault as well, but inevitably 50-50. But, oh boy, do I go off on one, you know, and the, the, the invective that goes out, and then the minute you've done it, you think, I don't believe it. Because you can't unwind it. Um, and although some of it's true, you know, it's lost. Because one of the things that's frustrating about having something like bipolar is you become the patsy for everyone else. Mm -hmm. So in relationships, I've had uh, people have a get-out clause as well, which is, oh, you're just off your head, you know. And... Uh, I told one lady friend that I was seriously in love with that actually ended and I ended up trying to kill myself because of it and I'm still in love with her. Um, it's all gone pear-shaped. Um, <clears throat> but I, you know, I, I did the same thing. Just did, did something like that and all the stuff that maybe she had done was lost. Because I just took it to a different level. So it's doubly frustrating, it's like a double whammy. Uh, if you can understand that, you know, you feel doubly guilty now because uh, doubly irritated is maybe the right term, you know, because it's all gone spectacularly pear shaped you shot yourself in the foot, and every other sort of cliche you can imagine. I think I got bipolar when I was in my uh, teens, um, which I think is fairly common, I wouldn't say it's, uh, I don't know what statistics or whatever, but it's fairly common to get it in your teens, um, and that's, guess what, your class is a nasty, horrible little teenager, I'm sure some of you have got them, or you've had them. And most of them grow out of it, but um, when you get to 25 and you're still acting like a tantrum 14 year old, you start to think something's wrong. <laughs> and then you go through a period, or I did, which is, uh, I don't know, in your 20s or, or, or whatever, 30s, you get married, um, you get onto that sort of thing that we all get onto, which I'm glad I'm off now, which is a treadmill of a mortgage, 
the kids, the bills, a bigger house, bigger mortgage, you know, we'd love it to have a BMW and all that type of thing. And, and all those were props for me to actually pretend that life would be great and there's nothing wrong with me as long as I can just get this and that's what's really wrong, I'm frustrated in the job. So, the bipolar would get me terrific jobs. Sorry, am I going to have a range? <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it, so you know, bipolar. <laughs> That's a good thing, you see. I've learned whenever something goes wrong, I say, I can't help it, darling, I'm bipolar. She said, don't pull that one again. <laughs> um, but jobs were characterised, having more clubs than Jack Nicholas, and it was characterised by the same cycle. And if you've been there, you know exactly what I'm talking about, which is the creativity in the chat. Like this, I can be terribly, I can be terribly charming and charismatic. You know? I'm handsome, I'm good looking, I mean, I'm, I'm probably the sexiest 60, 60 year old in this room. Well, <laughs> in fact, I know I am. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not joking, am I? Well, just don't get this <laughs> <laughs> I kept sort of, you know, prompting me. Um, it's the whole thing is, is, is a nonsense type condition that way, but you feel very charismatic. And I feel a fraud when I'm doing it sometimes, but I know that actually you're being able to con someone. And that's the difficulty if you're in relationships and you're a carer or you're with someone. It's defining, isn't it? At what point I need to be considerate and reasonable, or am I being stitched up here? And a lot of the time it is bipolar, and sometimes it isn't. And I, I certainly hide, hide behind it. But in those jobs, I would find that I would go in. And because of the creativity and the charisma and that sort of stuff, I would soar, you know, like, a, like an eagle. That was even my perception. I'd be the next CEO in waiting. What a great hire. And then as familiarity gets in and the mood swings, and you, you, you start to lose that mood, I would start to drop cods. <laughs> um, uh, one job um, uh, I lost because I've always liked to speak my mind, so that's your personality coming into it. And, uh, You've always been in a room where you get the idiot with a flip chart and everybody's bored out of the skull, um, but no one says anything. I'm the guy who says something. Um, and I said to this guy, Rod, I said, you know, Rod, um, we've just announced that you're the sex director. And he said, I, I better wash up some people in the room. I'll, I'll, I'll spare them. But I said, well, we want your effing opinion. We'll ask for it. And uh, as a result, I left the company. <laughs> I didn't get fired. I left, you know. Just before I was fired, I sometimes find after when I'd met people after I'd left, I didn't need to have left. You know, I'd psychologically talk myself out of the job and thought that if I go somewhere new, funnily enough, so I'm in human resources, and I used to ask people in a room like this in a company, I'd say, how many of you would act differently in the next job? And all hands would go up. But people don't do it in the current job. We all have to change our spots. So I would I had eight, eight jobs in 30 years, which is catastrophic, but. Really, I look back and I left far too soon sometimes. Um, but I've always been true to myself. At one point, uh, after that incident, um, I went to another company and the CEO, um, uh, I thought was an idiot and found it very hard to disguise it. Um, and, you know, idiot. <laughs> and he came to me as the HR director in those days with Royal Insurance. And uh, uh, he was the sort of bipolar opposite of me in a sense. I had nothing against old Etonians, but he was an old Etonian. And I'm just a... You know, as far as he was concerned, a coarse grammar school boy from, from uh, Lancashire, uh, rough as a bear's behind. So we both had our prejudiced positions. I thought he was thick as mince, uh, and he was. So we had a good start, you know. <laughs> and he joined the company and said, now Chris, you know what, uh, what do you think I should do in terms of, you know, uh, getting the team? And I said, well, you know, what would you do? He said, I said, well, I'd stick up a flip chart and say, these things are negotiable. You know, salaries and things like these. These things are not negotiable, you know, and that's my job description. He said, oh, I like that. I'm going to put... Um, and we mustn't have be late for meetings. So I said, I wouldn't do that if I was you, Giles. He said, why? He said, because you're always late for meetings. I said, so you'd be shot. Right, right. What did he do? We went off and told him he shouldn't be late for meetings. So armed with this fact, I then sat in a meeting a week later in a, in a good bipolar mood, like not. And I saw him and I was with another guy. I said, just look at that idiot. He's just come out. He has no idea he's meeting us at 10 o'clock. I said, what should we do? I said, we'll just sit here. Five to 11, he comes in and... Uh, uh, again, I'll, watch, I'll, I'll, I'll just use the F word, but you know, I, I use it too much, I'm afraid. But anyway, um, he said, oh, I'm sorry I'm late. And I said, you're not late, you're late. And uh, eventually, anyway, I left that company. <laughs> 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 and uh, part of our placement they gave me, we, 
which I didn't need anyway, you know, this other outplacement. I've even done that rubbish, but you know, when you sit there, they had a tame psychologist, so I thought, I'm going to have some fun here. Because I had loads of these guys, and uh, he sat there very earnestly with me, and he sort of said, now, did you think at that point that the, the, the managing director would say, you know, Kit's right. Um, you know, I, I really need to get my act together, and I'm glad the subordinates had the guts to tell me that. I said, did he? Hell, he went over thinking I was going to get rid of me. He said, exactly. He said, so, in hindsight, if you could live that moment over again, would you change your behaviour? So let me just think about that for a nanosecond. No. So I've always tried to live true to myself, but a lot of times in bipolar, it does get you in trouble. Um, and you, I, you know, I can look back sometimes, still have a red face at some of the things I did 25, 30 years ago in the office. And nothing illegal, but just pure, what they would see as immature behaviour, because when you get either hyper, you become crazy and immature and do stupid things. Or depression, you literally throw all the toys out of the pram and everybody hates you and you make a complete jackass of yourself. So I spent a lot of time in my career making a complete mess of it. But then we get into psychiatrists. Um, my experience of them is, any in the room? <laughs> I meant safe hands. Um, Yeah, okay. And what's the joke? And that's 9% of psychiatrists give the rest a bad name. Um, <laughs> I've had bad experiences. I'm not, I'm not against them. I think the problem for me is like doctors as well, and I'm not against doctors. There's some fantastic doctors, but what they haven't got necessarily is insight. <coughs> you can train to like house good moment, all the subject matter, and read every book on it, but if they haven't got that thing called insight. Now, I have a huge insight because somehow my brain works that way, so I can write books and get people to actually say, wow, you know, you just described my life. Um, but they don't. So you would get a lot of just pretty reflective behavior. Um, so, uh, you know, th 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 my favorite joke of that is, you know, I went to the psychiatrist and I said, could you help me out? He said, sure, which way did you come in? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's about as helpful as it's been to me. So um, I went to 11. Um, I ended up with a German one who uh, told me about the relaxation techniques. As I sat there, and all the knees said to relax and just imagine I was naked. Uh, that's what he said. I thought this is going to be interesting. And <laughs> I was just to say, you know, you're a very handsome man, a fine figure of a man, and I'd have been out of there. But he was telling me then to, you know, imagine molten, uh, molten metal filling my hollow legs and so on you know, and relaxing. Exactly. Now, halfway through, I said, you know what, it's not even got to my knees and I'm out of here. <laughs> so I gave up that. Then I went, I got really desperate, and I got put on, um, somebody shouted Prozac earlier, who was it? <laughs> <laughs> Prozac, or, or whatever, Peroxetine's another one. Um, uh, they go from, I've got a friend already who's gone in with depression, and she's gone literally from nowhere, 20 milligrams to 60 milligrams in four weeks, which I think is just unbelievably appalling. Um, just to do that, um, and then we try a different one so you don't know what meds you're on. For me, the best thing about the meds were, had belching um, been an Olympic sport, <laughs> you know, I'd have been a triple gold medalist, I'd been uh, with uh, Sir Bradley Wiggins, and been Sir Kip Johnson for, you know, supreme Olympic efforts in belching, I could have belched for the world, you know. So, um, the beauty of that is then, um, you stop taking them, but you keep belching, it's perfect. Absolutely perfect. Um, they have these list of side effects, um, uh, and I'll be very gentle with you, but one of the ones is, you know, this popular term that's come up nowadays called erectile dysfunction. That's a great one, isn't it? You know, so let's cure depression and give you erectile dysfunction. Perfect, I love it. You, you talk me into it. But it's not even as you imagine, actually. Anybody who's taken those realise it's not that actually, you know, actually you have got a cruise missile and it just doesn't detonate an impact. <laughs> Okay, sorry to be true, but that's what it's like. So then you go through that, and you come out at the other end of that, um, and then I'm now on, on Neprazole tablets, which are the things that control um, indigestion, which I can't get rid of. And the side effects of that, it's now going to send me bald. It's perfect. And guess what? I'm still bipolar. <laughs> so it's an absolute pig, because I don't know what mood I'm going to wake up in, or what I'm going to do, um, it trips me up all the time, but you've got to learn, or I feel you've got to learn to actually, if you can, manage it yourself. Um, not easy for everybody, but for me, that's one of the turning points. When that turning point, the white light, something triggered in my mind. I thought, you know what? There's no way I'm going to have this beating any longer. 
because I think we do go to the doctors and look for, you know, a headache, that's great. But, I mean, did you know that if you're, if you study the American psychiatrist, ASA, DSM-4, has anybody heard of that? Yeah. It's lethal. And the, the UK are following it now. So if you are a woman in the UK and you are grieving for your husband or a loved one, and you go to the doctors and you say, doctor, I can't sleep, and I'm struggling and it's really, I'm really toiling, instead of me saying it's part of grieving, and go away and grieve, and grieve and grieve as long as you want, it's normal, they will give you an antidepressant. And to give you the antidepressant, they class you as depressed. And that stays on your record. That now means, as from now, you can't do jury service for 10 years. Did you know that? This is what's going on behind the scenes that people don't know. So do not, under any circumstances, or something like that, allow yourself to be prescribed these things because it's not as innocent as it looks. Um, so I found that, you know, their doctors really haven't got a scooby. Um, one of my doctors had said to me, you know, and she said, so what is cyclothymia? And then they started looking it up. Um, and uh, uh, cyclothymia is what I have, which is rapid cycling, so there's different types of bipolar, so I can have about four mood swings in a day. So they should call it the British weather. Uh, <laughs> um, and it is, it is a nightmare, but I've learned uh, essentially to try and make fun of it, to mock it, um, to laugh at it. I don't always uh, succeed, um, but my business partners and people in the UK, uh, in, in Dubai now say, but I've never seen bipolar. I said, no, because I make sure that, I, I, well, let me step back. I now live on my own. And I wonder whether for me it's better to live on my own and have relationships but not deep relationships because I had a relationship recently again and I go back to the well <coughs> and it goes pear-shaped and it's not always me but what happens is if you're honest about it the other partner isn't honest they, they, they use you as the default that's it so they've done nothing wrong with you that, that's what I that's been my experience and that's so frustrating you just want a little bit of fairness you know you realize that probably if you were scoring it it would be sort of 70 30 my fault but that's maybe the word I would use most often in my life, like a teenager. It's unfair. I feel it's unfair. <clears throat> and the lady I was chatting to earlier, uh, uh, she's saying her daughter has it. And it's, you don't look at life through the same prism as someone else. You know? So you really do not see things the way they see it. And there's no point in trying to get them to see it. At that moment, I'm entirely rational. To you, I'm completely irrational. But... You know, to them, I'm irrational, I'm not making any sense, but I'm, I'm, I'm out there. And I can talk quicker, I can argue better, or I think I can, because I can argue and think at the same time, I don't get emotional, and I can raise the stakes, lower the stakes, play games, do all sorts of stuff, because I'm just on a, you know, on a, on a trajectory. And then when it goes wrong, the terrible thing is you just can't undo it, you know, so I find myself up the road, having walked out of a relationship, and that's what led to me climbing in the car, thinking, the end of the relationship wasn't really, maybe, the overall issue. It's a feeling of failure that I've done it again. And I feel sometimes it's a bit like if life's a 100 meter race, I've given all this equipment, but somebody's actually tied some bloody elastic. And I get to about 60 meters, I can see the finishing line, so they twang it, pulls me right back to the beginning again. And when it's done that 30, 40, 50, 100 times, and you go back to go, and you have to apologise to people in the relationship and you feel you've blotted your copybook. Because I think the other thing that's left with me, and I don't know if that's my personality or not, because this is back to this overlay, what your core personality is, plus the bipolar, is that I have this need for being loved and, and for uh, sort of perfection, uh, which is unre unrealistic. So I, I, the last thing I'm is, is, is offering any kind of perfection. So I get completely undermined. Um, in terms of your smile, I was just thinking you as <laughs> a private thought going, well, why can't you love me as much as I do? <laughs> exactly, exactly. You've been there. And, uh, sorry? <laughs> but, um, yeah, I could be like that, and uh, you're right. Yeah. You're dead right. And, and I think I just catch whiskers, you know. Um, if I'm in the right mood, I'll send out a um, thing on Twitter saying, you know, it's a picture of me, Mr. February. Um, and I get a bit of fun when I'm depressed, you know, I, I just I can barely speak. And it's just, it's, the, the ups and downs are absolutely terrifying. And people um, uh, with depression probably feel that people 
really think a lot of the time they can make a better fist of it than they do. But for me, it's like somebody throwing a big blank, you know, like a huge overcoat. You can't find your way out of it. Um, it it's like a physical weight. It's, it's, it's beyond just sort of a, a mental thing. There's a physicality to it. You just feel drained. Your legs give way. You just, and you can't explain it. And you feel pathetic. You know, you feel as if you're a failure. So I probably spent half my life feeling a failure. And the other half feeling I'm born for greatness. <laughs> so, I, I'm a living inspiration to you because, um, no, I seriously am, I am, sorry. <laughs> He's right, but I, I should be, because I look normal, I sound normal. <clears throat> Do you want the downsides? I'm absolutely dirt poor. I don't own my house any longer. I rent a house in Dubai. I live as a consultant from job to job. I have no car. My entire life, okay, this is my entire life. Two credit cards, an iPhone for business, and a key for the plan. Perfect for my bipolar. It suits me very well. The minute I add women to it, mortgages to it, cars to it, debts to it, I plummet. I can't deal with it. So I've learned in a sense that although I would love to be married again and be happy ever after and stagger on into my 80s being loved, I've had to step aside from that and realise I can't do that because it's not good for me. I'm better off on my own. It's taken me a long time to realise that. You know, my life the opposite sex and um, it's quite sad, but it, every time I've done it, I get the same feelings coming over me, the pressure of the relationship. That person's not really doing anything at all. It's just, you know, it's normal for them. Um, but that's what's happened to me. So, for me, I couldn't have imagined five or six years ago being so dirt poor and actually being able to go. If I'd have known how dirt poor I am by comparison, you know, to what I was five or six years ago before I got divorced and all the money went down the toilet, the business went down the toilet, everything went down the toilet in about three or four years. Um, and that led to that sort of uh, suicidal feelings. But actually, I've come around the other end and realised that, you know, the money doesn't mean anything to me. Um, you know, I had all the things that people wanted a few years ago. I was probably worth about three quarters of a million a few years ago in business. I'm exaggerating now, I probably look, my net worth is about 4,000 quid and a pathetic pension. But I'm actually happier now probably than ever be, ever be. So, you know, what's, you know, what's not to like sort of thing. So conscious of keeping to that sort of schedule, I'm only sort of like 20 minutes in, but anything I've said so far that people want to develop as a, as a thought, don't be bashful or, yeah. When did you become self-aware? As a, as a child growing up and going through teenagehood, and you, you touched on it possibly yeah. appearing in teenagehood, yeah. When to you was the moment when you kind of said to yourself, Ugh. Probably in my twenties at some point, yeah. because you get, obviously when you're a teenager, you're at other teenage homes as well, and they get your room cleaned, and there's that sort of free son of teenage stuff anyway. Probably in my mid-twenties. Uh, I've, uh, that my first marriage, I've been married three times, what a surprise. Um, yeah, probably in my twenties. But and did, did you go looking for for a cure or for, I for medication. No, I look for excuses. No. I knew there was something wrong, but that was as far as my thinking taught me. I knew deep down there was something not quite right about me, but I was the hell if I was going to admit to it. Yeah. So I would look for these things like, you know, a new car, or I just want to get that TR6 and then everything would be fantastic. Literally as pathetic as that. Mm -hmm. um, looking for little um, sinecures. Um, and then you get a bit older and you realise the relationship's gone, you're down the divorce, you're into the next one, you want it to work, and hey, Crystal, the same things are happening. Um, so I probably became bullied into it by my wife. Um, now, yeah, probably she should have said, yeah, you get yourself sorted or I'm out of here. Um, it still annoys me. I put it in my book, you know, I thought it was richer or poorer, uh, sickness and in health. <laughs> She wants it richer, um, health, and what's the other one? Better. <laughs> she didn't buy into the other ones, that's me being a bit cynical. But at the end of the day, she had a point, you know, it was difficult to live with. Um, I think the sad thing for me about mental illness that I get pretty hairy chested about is that it is the last bastion of, of prejudice because if you're in a marriage and, uh, I don't know, somebody, uh, you married them and then they in a car smash and they become impaired or uh, whatever, they, they lose a limb or something really serious happens, if their partner walks out on them because they can't cope, everybody thinks that's bloody disgusting, you know, absolutely awful. But if somebody walks out on somebody who's got bipolar, 
well, you need to get out of there. You know, that's not good. You can't live like that. So there is definitely a difference. I, personally, I can't see the difference. I'm not scoring points here, but for me, it's one of those ones still acceptable to sort of back out. And I think if you have a partner, some, I, I've got a lot of followers now on Twitter, and some people, I really envy them because they say, I've just got a wonderful partner, he gets it. Or she gets it. And we've had our ups and downs, but you know they get it, they know how to manage it, and they do have an insight. But a lot of people just, they can't be bothered with it. So they, they, they move on. So I got bullied into it in my 30s, but then I had this bad experience of psychiatrists. And I was told I was anencastic. You know, exactly. And I thought I was ruptured when I said that. You know. <laughs> and, you know, I sort of started walking like that. And, you know, sort of. um, I, have you ever heard of that, Alan Castic? No, exactly. I, I don't think he had. I think he was just one he looked up. Um, and I went home and thought, no, I'm not. Um, and uh, I probably had all sorts of uh, other ones. Somebody said there was nothing wrong with me at all. <laughs> and basically, just to get a grip. Um, that was really helpful. I really enjoyed that, you know. That was a priory for you. You know, it cost me £250 for that opinion. There's nothing wrong with you, thanks. <laughs> Um, I find a lot of them is that they sit and listen, they don't say much, and it, suddenly it's over and it's £120. And I can't help thinking there's a commercial imperative there, that they want to help you, but sadly there is a commercial imperative. At the end of the day, you are um, a booking. And uh, I've got uh, my best friend in, 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 in is a local uh, in, in the Emirates. He's, he's got two depressed daughters and uh, uh, an Asperger's son. Now, he sent his daughter to a clinic in Boston, and they're charging him $30,000 a month. And uh, she's been self-harming. She's been there nine months, and guess what? She still needs more time there. And I said, Ali, get a grip. I said, $30,000 a month? You're dead right she's never going to be cured. They'll have her there all her life. Do you think so? Yeah. Um, because there's no evidence. So I'm, I'm being cynical because I have to be honest with you. That's, pretty much been my experience, but I, I do accept that there are some very good people out there and some people have got some fantastic relationships, but out of my followers, the vast majority of whom I would say are A, women, interestingly enough, nothing to do with my looks or charm, the fact that I think women talk about it more, the mental health, um, like in here I think there's more women than men, and they'll chat more about, that's been my experience, and the vast majority have to say here, here, most of my retweets are jokes about psychiatrists. No. Yeah. Kit, listening to you and uh, your experiences through life, mm -hmm. I get the feeling that there came a point in time some years ago where you accepted that you were bipolar mm -hmm. instead of fighting it. Yeah. And from then on, in a sense, sort of rode alongside it and accepted it. Yeah. And presumably then you were able to start looking for the positive side yeah. of being bipolar, yeah. and then is that how you've yeah, pretty done much. things I, over I, I, recent years? Yeah, I, I, <coughs> I probably accepted, I, I'm trying to think when I got, I think it, probably about 10, 12 years ago I got diagnosed, and it took a while, I sort of knew it and accepted it, but I still didn't totally accept it, you know what I mean, I still sort of <coughs> sought out some kind of, you know, maybe this or maybe I'll go out of it, maybe if I stop taking Pepsi Cola and mm. go on the diet, I think diet can have an impact. I think exercise, I go to the gym seven days a week, I have to do, and, and I think that helps exercise, just, um, uh, I like to keep myself busy, I think if I've got idle time, I don't sleep well, I just sleep, I sleep okay, but I can't get to sleep for about an hour and a half, because my brain's just going crazy, it just won't wind down, so I can read, I can do all sorts of stuff, have hot chocolate, hot toddy or whatever, but I will lie there, um, and then uh, you get back here at my age, so <laughs> this is great bipolar, and I love it, love it. You know. So I'm sorry, I don't want to hog the... No, no, it's not, no. But it, the sort of supplementary is, yeah. so do you now feel that you, you've turned it into a positive, being bipolar? Yeah, yeah. I, I just was saying, I mean, I wouldn't be standing here if I wasn't bipolar. I wouldn't have a book for sale if I wasn't no. bipolar. No. I wouldn't be on, I've got my own radio show now on it. There's a huge interest in it, a um, weekly radio show. Yeah. Um, I've been on TV in the US now, big deal, I'm not name dropping, I'm just meaning that all these things are because I'm bipolar. So would you rather be bipolar? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, if it's a case of you draw 63 million on the Euro millions and bipolar, I'd turn around and say I'd rather be dirt poor mm. and actually not have the bipolar. Mm. It's hugely tiring. Mm. Um, it, it, it wears me out, it's reduced me to tears uh, on lots of occasions and just literally want to tear your hair out. 
but it's better now that I've accepted it and actually get the best out of it. Um, so it does make me creative. Um, it, if I'm in the right mood, it does make me, I think, <laughs> quite witty and uh, you know, in tweets I can bounce things and get people laughing. And, and it's, it's actually <coughs> given me something that I was quite a selfish person before, so I'm not going to go through some great altruistic thing here, but um, I would not be helping the Samaritans and supporting them had it not been for bipolar. I'd be one of those ones who, you know, um, the only time I ever gave blood was when I was in Saudi Arabia in 1976, and that's because I got paid $400 for it. Um, which I felt guilty about for another 20 years, you know, when the blood donor band was outside. But I'm one of the ones who sailed through life thinking I really should, but I didn't. Which I think a lot of us are like that. Um, but now I really enjoy um, helping out because I can see a lot of people on, uh, write to me. Um, you know, I mean, I've helped split marriages up. <laughs> I had a woman, quite a funny story, wrote to me from Arizona and uh, she said, I want to chat to you about my husband. Is that okay? I said, sure. And she wrote to me. And she said, told me what it was, and I just had this picture of this redneck in Texas, and his uh, string vest and underpants, with a can of beer, um, you know, bullying this woman. And she said, I think he might be bipolar. And I wrote back and said, No, no, he's just a pig. <laughs> um, and, uh, and she wrote back. She said, I'm beginning to think you're right. <laughs> um, uh, she said, It smells bad enough, you know. Bad this. And she said, I have a sister in Montana. Um, uh, should I go there? And I said, Just go. Just go. And she said, oh, but, you know, it's very difficult. You know, I'm, I'm 56, I think. I said, look, love, I said, I didn't do it through choice. But, you know, in 2004, I had two parents and an only child. I had a wife who didn't help me because that was my bipolar. I was a pig. So she didn't help me with my parents. They both died badly of cancer. My daughter left university. I had a business partner cheat me out of £350,000. My business went bankrupt. I lost my home, lost my marriage. My wife cheated me out on my pension and ended up in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Uh, and then I lost my job in Saudi Arabia three years ago, and I got one in Dubai. I never lost my job there, and I set up the business. You just keep going. Um, you just keep going. Um, and uh, she said, oh my God, what an inspiration. And then she wrote me one about a month ago, saying, I've left him. And it's the best thing I've ever done. I should have done it ten years ago. You know? So you realize a lot of people just need a bit of help. And uh, you know, I suppose there's all the danger I sort of wreck someone's life. But... I'm in a position where you guys can't because you're not there to help and advise, you're there to listen and, and just be comfort, which is fantastic. But I don't, I, I've got license to say what I want, which is great. <laughs> so I can turn around and say, no, it's a pig. Um, it brings me on to something interesting because uh, bipolar, I think, has become sexy. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. You know? Would Catherine Zeta-Jones have come out if her career wasn't nosediving? Oh, what a cynic. How awful of me to say that, you know? But she's not quite the A-lister anymore, is she? You know? And had it been 20 years ago, when it was called manic depression, rather than bipolar, I just wonder whether she'd have come out. Mm. Mm. Now, I could be being very unfair, and I probably am, because I can be quite cynical, but quite a lot of them come out, because you see, uh, in Hollywood, it used to be, um, if you were gay and Jewish, you really got it made in Hollywood. Now it's gay, Jewish, and bipolar. Um, uh, and people will come out, you know, it's like Spartacus. You know? I'm, I'm bipolar. No, no, I'm bipolar. We're all bipolar. They're all C-listers. Um, I think somebody like Stephen Fry is bipolar. Um, I'm certain he is, you know, and he, that was last, last week's news and so on. And he said something which I agreed with, which is when he's being funny and witty, but at the same time he's probably thinking, I just want to die, I just hate this, you know. Uh, I never have those feelings. I usually, if I'm standing and I'm thinking how wonderful I am, and then I go away and want to die. Um, it's bizarre, but sometimes I actually just want to check out. And people think, what? Because he seems to have everything, doesn't he? Wit, charm, money, you know, and a lot of people try to say, get a grip, you're pathetic, you know. But it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's bad. So I think it's become uh, a little bit... I did a Huffington Post, uh, more name-dropping TV, but I got on it simply because um, now they Google me, I seem to be coming up on bipolar and, and so on. Um, is that a good thing? I'm not so sure, <laughs> actually. Looking back, I'm not sure it's something to be... Well, what the hell, anyway, but I come up. And the, the issue there was childhood bipolar, uh, and they did a show um, with uh, uh, Mariel Hemingway, who's uh, Ernest Hemingway's granddaughter, her sister Margot was a supermodel and uh, killed herself, father was a depressive and blew his brains out even though he was one of arguably a, a great writer. Um, but I was on a program with her because it was about, would you believe that the diagnosis of childhood bipolar 
di you know, diagnosing kids with child and bipolar, how much do you think it's gone up in the last 10 years in the US? Mm. You wouldn't have a clue, 4,000%. It's just not credible. It's just not credible. Um, I've got a friend uh, who's uh, got a, a, a girl, <coughs> and she, they took her to a Harley Street psychiatrist, and after 45 minutes, he said she was bipolar and sociopath, after 45 minutes, with a teenager, you know, which she can't get any sense out of a 14-year-old in any event. <laughs> So after 45 minutes, to actually write that down, I just think it's just unbelievable. And of course, in, uh, here it's, you've got a, what is it, ADHD, you know? No, he's just, he's just hyper. You take him off the coke and the smarties, you might find a big difference, you know, he's off the ease. Or he just might be energetic. You know, when kids, when you say they go to the zoo at three years old, you know, they just hype, they jump, don't they? They bounce. And when you get to 18, we've had it knocked out, it was, oh, and all that again, you know? So. I found that it's, you know, it's become a sort of a, yeah, it's almost like it's sexy, like it's something to, you know, I, yeah. So I get um, uh, people saying, oh, uh, I, I think I might be bipolar, or um, I've got a friend who's bipolar. Really? Right. <laughs> Trust me, you know, you'd know if they're bipolar, but just because they're a bit moody. Or, uh, yeah, he, my last boyfriend, he was bipolar. They don't know what it means, but now they just trot it out. Or you get one saying, so is that like two moods? Right. So you mean you're schizophrenic? No. So it's been, as I say, sexed up. I mean, do I, what someone said, who said today? I think, was it Louise? Did you say, would I prefer being bipolar or manic depressive? And uh, yeah, and I suppose, yeah, I'd rather be set bipolar than manic depressive. It sounds slightly better, doesn't it? Um, I'm a cynic about these things anyway. When I started out my career, it's called personnel. And then it became human resources at some point in, 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 in uh, you know, 1990, and that's human capital. And the latest one I saw, just as an aside, was an advert from um, uh, consultants looking for human performance architects. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, you, you know, you couldn't invent it, but you're human performance architects, you know, so. Um, any other things on, I can, yeah? Okay, what's your experience of um, the effects of medication? Well, for me, it, they made me worse. So I went on, I'm trying to forget it. I went on, I think, I think it was peroxidine or suroxidine, I can't remember, maybe two. Then they swap you, and they're, and they're all different. And you end up, you don't know really your backside from your elbow a lot of the time. And if you start mixing them up, you're really in trouble. Because you don't know what's working, what isn't working. Um, and then they give you, you know, if you're struggling, they give you more. And then you're dependent on it when you come off. You know, it's a bit like the arm for HRT, unless you really need it, all you're doing is putting off the menopause for 10 years. So I feel great in my 50s, but you're still going to have to go through in your 60s, you know. So I'll carry on to lament it, you know, but I mean, it, it's, it's obviously needed for some people, but for me it made me ill, it made me feel depressed. Um, I had a friend on Prozac who actually committed suicide after six weeks on Prozac. Now, I don't know if you can make the connection, and obviously the medical profession will sidestep that, but it was a of a coincidence. Um, so I found it bad, they, they upset my stomach, they gave me all these other problems, uh, which I still got. Because it kicked off this indigestion, which now just won't go away, it's a bit like kicking off a nasal problem, and now um, I, I wish I'd never taken them. But they did it because you get desperate. Um, you're willing to try anything. I think in my book I said, if somebody said, you know, sitting on a uh, camel, sitting backwards, probing sheep's entrails while playing with your milk and back again on the bagpipes, if somebody said that would cure bipolar, I would do it. <laughs> Um, I'd try anything, but the fact is um, that the meds, I think, are good for some, not for others. They were bad for me, but um, somebody said the other day, oh, you need to go on lithium. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll just rock my liver and kidneys out. Perfect, yeah, you know. And so, and again, if I write uh, uh, tweets, I just sort of said, you know, I, I do daft things like I'd say, you know, um, what did I put on uh, one? I think it was uh, SSRIs. You know, uh, 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 not from the uh, Alpha Centauri, you know, and uh, lithium uh, is not a new planet or whatever. Oh, I must be bipolar. Um, yeah. how, do, how do you cope without the medication when you get suicidal thoughts? I've managed it more by knowing I'll get through it, mm -hmm. and knowing not to fight it, and knowing not to worry about it. And back to what I said, I think it's really helped in managing my life. I can't say I've been hugely. Uh, perspicacious about it, you know, I suddenly saw the way to do it. I think circumstances, financially, um, pushed me into this situation of just living in Dubai in a rental flat where I own nothing, literally, 
And I sit back sometimes and think of how broke I am, and I can't believe how relaxed I am about it. Because I've stopped worrying that somebody said, oh, but what about in 10 years? I said, I might not be here in 10 years. And I get to I've spent all my life worrying. I can't remember when I didn't have a worry, you know. And I still wake up thinking I've got to sit my A-levels. <laughs> It's a nightmare, and then I wake up and say, oh my God, I took it 40 years ago. <laughs> you know, but ridiculous anxieties, and I think maybe a little bit when you get older, you do start to realise, you know what, you've got through it. But I don't get quite the same depressions, and I don't get quite the same highs. You know, I've, I've, I've sort of softened it off a bit. But I don't know whether that's... It could just be changing, you know, hormones, I think, could even change it. Who knows? I think things could be happening that I'm not aware of. People can be cured of it. And it sort of disappears. It hasn't for me, but um, I, I, the, the down bits, I just avoid people. And I just work my way through. But what I do is, I have a, a <laughs> um, you know, like, I think there's a spectrum of mental illness, and it's all a big circle, you know, like the autism spectrum, you know, I've heard about some of you, and, and Asperger's, and you've got <coughs> Tourette's, and then around here you've got bipolar. And I love bad words. When I'm in a bad mood, you know, I, I love bad words and swearing. It makes me feel better. Um, and you know, it's far better than saying flip, isn't it? You know, when you bang your toe, I mean, you know, something else is far better. It helps the pain, you know. So um, I've got one which is JFDI, okay, and I've got it on my fridge. And when I'm getting like that, I have it on my hand. And it stands for just <laughs> effing do it. <laughs> and it reminds me to just do something, you know. What it, and what I say to people, uh, there's a girl called Gina, and uh, she wants me to send her a book. Um, she's in Vancouver, she suffers from depression. And I sent that to her, she said, you're right, I need to do something. I said, just don't lie in bed, get up and watch TV. Get up and write something, get up and do something, but don't lie there festering, worrying about it. Just say, <clears> it's the way it is, it's the way I'm feeling. Good. Get out there and physically do it. And do it now. Um, and. I think it works. You just got to do something. Um, there's a technique which I have tried, which you might think is bizarre, but it works for me. Um, which is just to repeat the word "the." Okay. If you're really depressed, just or you have depression is not reality, is it? Although it's arguably chemically driven, you can talk yourself into it as well. You can, and it's all negative thoughts, and that's all the honest thoughts. It's not reality. It's not reality. It's not going to happen. So you have to break that negative thought. So when I do, I just go the 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 until I'm exhausted and it breaks the thought. Because just saying the 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 you don't have to say it aloud. You can say if you want box box Now whatever suits you, you can say something, but you just keep doing it because I can tell you that it uses up 95% of the brain's capacity. It stops you having negative thoughts. It's using a Buddhist mantra basically. You don't have to get into the zone or anything like that to you know, play a sitar, but it does break the cycle and it works for me. I've even tried cosmic ordering, Noel Edmonds style. <coughs> have you heard of that? Oh, this is something that came out in the 30s, that you know, you wish something and it happens. So I, I, I meet all sorts of interesting people on Twitter, and this lady came on to me from, uh, guess where, America? <laughs> Didn't come from Yorkshire, the nose. Um, and she came on to me and said, I think I can help you. I said, well, I'm open to anything, you know, you know sheep's entrails, I'll try, I'll try anything. <laughs> and, uh, and she said, well, no, not sheep's entrails, you know, you didn't get that. So I said, no, it's just my sort of pathetic sense of humor, let's move on. Um, <laughs> you made me think, oh, yeah. But she said, have you heard of cosmic ordering? And I said, well, go on. And she said, well, what you do is you think about what you want. And you write it down, you visualize it. Okay? Now, we can all find things in life, can't we, where you do something and then coincidentally, well, it works, you know. And if it doesn't work, you just discount it. So I have this mantra at home. You'd laugh about this, but I mean, I, 10 years ago, I'd never done it. I am a classic Lancastrian, you know, it's all bollocks. Everything's bollocks. Um, I don't believe in anything. It's all bollocks and, and pulling stuff together. I don't believe in any of that rubbish and uh, this type of thing. But I thought, I'm going to try this. She said, have you done that? I said, yes. I said, I've written it all down. She said, have you printed it out? I said, yes. So what I've got on this sheet of paper, I kid you not, is I want to be successful with my book. And I put a little thing on it, number one bestseller. You know, like the things you get, sticker on the thing? And I put that on a piece. Underneath, I put, I want to be famous, world famous. That's the next one. Then I want, I want to be um, a famous radio host. And I put that on. And then at the bottom, guess what? I couldn't miss that one. I want to be rich. <laughs> That hasn't happened yet, unfortunately. <laughs> but within two weeks, I've got a radio show. Now, 
You know, people say it's just coincidence, and yeah, it's probably pure coincidence, but I've been walking around going, I want to be rich. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's, who knows? The thing is, it's a willingness without going dotty to try anything, you know, and I'm quite prepared to just try anything. If it works, it just sort of un unscrews my head a little bit. What the hell, I'm not, I'm not harming anybody. And what I have found good about it is, um, like when I'm feeling bad about my ex-lover, because I really still love her. If you read my book, you know, some people, friends of mine said I burst into tears. They can feel the pain. And then have her back in the shop for the third time, you know, but it's not going to happen. I have to live with that. And it, therefore, I compensate sometimes by cow and stuff. And I don't really mean it. I'm just trying to manage it. And I'm walking every morning. I go for a walk every morning. And I use this cosmic ordering. And I switch out of what I'm thinking. And I go, I want to be famous, you know. I want to be, in my book will be a bestseller. I'm going to be a Jay Leno. I'm going to be this. I'm going to be that. And I tell myself. And then I forget the thought. And I'm back on a positive thought. I'm using something just to get out of it, rather than just festering all the way there. And then I go into the mall and somebody upsets me in the queue and I savage them, you know, because I'm in a bad mood and I call them a cretin at the till and it's really undeserved, you blithering half wit, you know, and destroy them mentally in about 10 minutes, such that they call them the Samaritans, you know, that's such a bad experience with the nutcase. Then I go upstairs and I feel dreadfully guilty and then I'm depressed, you know. Have you been there? You know, you think, brilliant, you know, it's only 8 o'clock and I've managed to completely ruin my life again. <laughs> So, um, yeah. When you're in that space of, you know, one way or the other, yeah. you the down, and you've got people who are close to you, uh, around you, do you expect them or desire them to behave in a certain way, or is there a way that would work for you? Are you with me? <laughs> yes, there is a way to work for me. Just do what I say. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there is. I, I think there are people out there who could do it. I think. Um, uh, you sometimes I think you're attracted to the wrong person. You're attracted to people who are probably not a million miles from like you, mm. in some respects. You know, people say opposites attract, but often you go for people who are, are maybe similar. Maybe I've been unlucky, but um, <clears throat> I, I think I do. I do generally. I, I know how bad I can be. I don't delude myself, but I'm not all bad. No, no, no. And, and that's the whole point. And I think. I've had partners who've gone for the, just switch off to any responsibility. When I came back from my first suicide, I, I'd had, um, rightly or wrong, this is how I looked at it, you know, I, uh, I got kicked out into the spare bedroom, not because I was a lousy lover or I'd been on SSRIs or cruise missiles and all that sort of rubbish, no, it's because apparently I snored. I've since been told actually by some other ladies, no you don't, something <laughs> You know, that's an interesting one, because I don't know if I snore, but I ended up in a spare room. And no affection from 1997 to 2007. No affection. Um, my wife at home, um, uh, five bedroom houses, a business partner cheating out of money, beating myself slowly into the ground, you know, getting hammered down, and just thinking, this is just so bloody unfair. You know, what the hell am I doing? You know, and, and being taken for granted. And the, the problem is, even down to... My parents dying of, badly of cancer, and I lived in Edinburgh and had to go down to Blackpool for 18 months. So they both had pretty, you know, the MRSA, the Stridium, good old NHS, you know, the full Monty. My wife, God rest her soul, was she not dead yet? Um, I live in hope. Um, <laughs> sorry, but I do, you know. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> and in 18 months, she never lifted the phone or came with me on one bloody trip, which I think is just absolutely gobsmacked. I wouldn't do that to my worst enemy. And then, do you know, I got told, we well, deserved it, you're horrible to live with. But it's okay we were buying villas in California and things were good, you know, and in a spare room. And you realise I'm in the smallest room in the house, and the house that I'm paying for, and the business that I'm having to rescue because of the business uh, guys let me down, and I'm getting a bad press. So maybe I had the wrong partners, but I think if you had the right partner, it's fantastic. But... It isn't, it, it, I have to come back, it, it can't be an easy condition to live with. Um, it's the unpredictability of it. And I think the trick is, don't take it personally. It's, I always have to agree, it's my sister who has it. Yeah. And I always go, she goes, well, right, you're this, you're that. You're yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're and right. if, you could, if you could switch off to it and realise she doesn't mean it. But it's difficult, no. you know, because sometimes she'll say things and you know exactly where to lance the boil. 
because part of my personality is I'm yeah. sharp and, and quick-witted and I, I'm, even when I'm normal I can say things pretty and straight in there and I know exactly where to hit someone, you know. And, and I'm instinctive where that? the weak spot is, the thing that will really hurt. And you're aware of that impact. Oh yeah. Completely right. Because yeah. you want it to hurt because you're hurting. Yeah. And the rationality is you're being unfair to me and I don't feel at that moment I'm being bipolar. At that moment our rationality, where's the lady who's speaking to you? The rationality is uh, and you understood that, is that they are convinced at that moment that they're right and you're wrong. And it's only afterwards then, and then you've got, you've got this triple, quadruple whammy of feeling guilty, I'm really sorry, I can't believe I said that, and then you say, it's all right, it's fine, move on, leave it. But they can't. And it's just this horrendous, horrendous cycle. Um, so I, I've not had a partner, but that's not to say it wouldn't work, but um, I, I do think some probably do... I do believe that, that for, for many, it's a, it's a get out clause for their bit. And when I'd had all this sort of stuff, I went off to the Lake District, I had my stomach washed out in Carlisle Infirmary, and the, the police dragged me off and everything else. It wasn't very pleasant. And I got back, and I sat on the stairs at home, uh, just finished, you know, I mean, completely finished. Uh, I'd had years of, you know, parents dying, this and that, businesses. And she came, well, she I'm divorcing you. I thought that was a nice one. Now, the timing was perfect. You know, not, darling, how can I help you, you know, how's it come to this, darling, you know, I mean, I know you're bipolar, you're struggling, but what am I doing wrong, you know, where, 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 where's it all gone wrong, no, I'm divorcing you. Um, and the thing that I found as well, um, because it's quite a charismatic thing, bipolar, so you can be very charismatic and quite magnetic, every single wife... <laughs> uh, how embarrassing. Um, <laughs> every single serious relationship um, has ended badly, and then within months they want to back together with me. <coughs> and I've had that writing to me saying that he, he's a pig or he's this or he's whatever, but he's given me the most wonderful moments of my life, you know. Um, and they get drawn back. And after I think a few months without my, you know, wondrous charisma and so on, um, they suddenly, you know, they just have to be drawn back to me. Well, you know this feeling, don't you? Know <laughs> <laughs> and they, they get drawn back, and then they go back for the second time and think, uh oh, I seem to remember why I did it in the first place. <laughs> um, it goes wrong the second time. And when I went back into it each time, you convinced this time less. Uh, I mean, the, the, the last big love of my life, she didn't know I was bipolar <coughs> because I thought I was controlling it. And then she didn't know we were bipolar, that explains a lot. We got back together. Uh, but then within days of just having a minor disagreement, I mean a minor disagreement, you're all set up, you just say, oh dear, you know, straight in there, you're a fruitcake, you know, and that really was depressing, because you just, that will do, you know, and that, that really knocked the stuff in out, and I thought, I can't believe this, you're supposed to, here we go again. Um, yeah. Do you think that um, us, when we bipolar, you see things very sort of black or white, it's not, you know, because I, I, I have some experience talking to people with uh, various mental health issues, and it seems very hard to have sort of shades of grey and, and perhaps to be objective and see how the other person is seeing a situation. You know, you, you're either, you know, particularly if you're that, so it's, you can only see your own way and you're absolutely certain you're right. Yeah. It is very black and white. I mean, I, I think I've said uh, it's like a yin and yang condition. Mm. It's left, right, up, down, in, out. There's nothing in between. There are no shades of grey. Um, yeah, it's, I agree. It's right, it's right or wrong, but of course there are lots of shades in between. <laughs> And I would be accused probably quite readily that my way to me, there's no, when you're in a bad mood, there's no way of discriminating your anger. I know where to see that anger, I, let me think, I'm just trying to think of something, if I had uh, something she might have done, that forgot to do something in the house or whatever, something like that, uh, would be no different than if I caught, came home and caught her in bed with three men. You know, you'd just be the same. And then you'd get, well, you're always angry. You know, and there's probably some truth in that. Um, uh, that they, you know, so when you're ready and you want to say, but I'm really angry this time, you know, I really mean it this time. And that's a bit like teenagers, isn't it? Don't slam the door. You know, whatever you do, don't slam, bang. Um, and you say, oh, here we go. And I really mean it this time, you know, it's the end of the world and everything. But unfortunately, it's like that. Did you feel any paranoia? Oh, yeah, I definitely get paranoid. Um, I think one of the problems is that um, when I've written bad letters, what happens is that the worst thing you could do with me, if you ever, you know, fall in love with me, fall out with me. <laughs> <laughs> not to be recommended, it's not going to happen anymore. <coughs> no, it's definitely not going to happen anymore. <laughs> um, 
would be um, it falls apart, let's say, and then there's silence and there's no communication. And that silence for me creates paranoia. And I get all things out of shape. I imagine all sorts of horrendous stuff get out of shape and I just play things out in my head and literally go temporarily insane. And I will create all sorts of stuff and then unfortunately I commit it to writing. And I send an email that suddenly leaves people, you know, in shock. They can't believe where all this venom and bias come from. They're absolutely in shock. And then of course then I feel, you know, I've done it again. I can't believe I've done it. But at that moment, do I sit over the keyboard and think, should I, shouldn't I? No. I mean, I'll break the keyboard, hit it, enter. You know, take that, you know. And then not finish then, I've got the phone and leave a voice message. I think, oh, SMS as well, you know, just in case she misses that one. And you just get bombarded. And I've heard other people do that, and that's the paranoia. Um, and then you feel dreadful afterwards. You feel absolutely dreadful. And there's no words you can get out of it, because you can't undo what you've said. Even though people can forgive you, you can't undo it. Um, and I've told myself, to, and unfortunately, I think <laughs> it's been a lot easier with my condition, or if you've got it, if you'd lived 30 years ago. But now modern media is so easy to just take that SMS or text. I mean, 30 odd years ago, I don't think my parents had a phone, so, you know, and if you were 10 miles up the road, you could have abused what you wanted, but you couldn't even speak to them. No voicemails, but now you can leave a voicemail, you, you know, that sort of stuff. So I don't think it helps. The convenience of, uh, of multimedia uh, encourages you to behave badly. Or, or not, not encourages you, but it gives you the, the opportunity. Whereas if I hadn't got that, common sense would probably prevail before I'd make a, a fool of myself. But when you're hurting, it's like anybody doesn't know what, it, what it's like when they're hurting. You get the pain is just indescribable, and you think if I don't get rid of this, some of this bile, you know, it's going to kill me. You know, and I literally have to sort of spew it out, and somebody's going to get covered in it, and it feels better because I think at that point I actually believe they're going to try and say you're right. I've been an absolute cow. Um, I actually believe that, you know, and say, darling, I love you. How could I have been such an idiot to doubt you? You're just wonderful. Funny, it never happens. <laughs> Kit, um, I wonder, uh, I'm wondering what sort of work you do and whether you work to pay the bills or whether you work because it's all part of helping you go through life. Um, I've always been someone who uh, works to live. Um, I've always winged it. I've been blessed. I've got a good brain, so I wing it. You know, I don't. Um, uh, I'm not a grafter. If I can get, if I can shortcut something, I will do. I'm quite happy to shortcut things. Um, I don't think I should have gone into human resources, to be honest with you. I mean, just, I don't, I never liked it, so it's a wrong career. I should have been a salesman, you know. Uh, they've been perfect, selling stuff and then moving on, I don't care what happens afterwards. <laughs> I've got the sale, that's it. But it doesn't work, it doesn't do 180 miles an hour, don't bother me, I'm on to the next one, you know. Um, but funnily enough, I'm good at it because I'm, I'm working in Saudi at the moment, and I'm putting a load of Saudis, I mean, trust me, Saudi is one weird place, you know. Um, it's not a good place to have bipolar. If you're depressed, say, you never come out again, you know. When you're out at the airport, it's bad enough. I think it actually turns people bipolar when you go through customs. <laughs> um, you have no idea unless you've been there. It's, it's absolutely <coughs> mitigated beast of a place. But the Saudis love it because, they, they, you know, I, I know this for a fact. I was at the American Embassy about three or four years ago chatting about this, and there's a, a Saudi psychiatrist, there are only three in Saudi. They don't believe in mental illness. It doesn't exist. It does not exist. It's all Allah. Yes. No, seriously, it is. You know, so they don't, it doesn't exist. So I'm very good at being, you know, doing career counselling and being quite insightful. And you give them a little bit of that, and you think it's just wonderful because you're able to. Um, I mean, there was a guy just the other day. I put him through a psychometric test, and uh, I also knew a bit about him. So I was cheating as well. I said, you know, he said, well, what's it saying? I said, well, I said. When you're in a boardroom, whatever, you probably say, there's ten things, and the boss is saying, great, you know, great. I said, and the tenth will be something stupid. I said, and that's what they'll remember, the, the tenth thing. Um, he said, that's exactly right, that's exactly right. I said, well, what can I do? I said, well, stop, cut it out. You know? He said, how do you know all this? I said, because I've been doing it for 40 years. <laughs> and that's what I used to do. But I had a good boss who said, look, I'd rather take the nine good things and live with a, a cock-up. He said, but see if you can chase a cock-up. And he was great. So he said, I coach and counsel you. This is a good story, actually. Because he said, I can tell the body language you're about to make a jackass of yourself, you know. And uh, uh, he would watch, and he sat next to me, and I'd forgotten about all this. And 
I remember I must have been about to say, you know, something offensive to somebody across the table. That everybody would be very grateful for, in my opinion, you know. <laughs> They'd all be thinking, well done. Yeah. That's your career over, but well done. You know. <laughs> the guy is a man. Um, uh, thank God somebody said it. Pity your career's over. There we go. And um, uh, just as I'm about to do the body language, you know, and my mouth was agape open, ready to say it, and he kicked me in the shins. <laughs> and I screamed, you know, it was really like painful. I was in blood going down my shins. <coughs> And somebody said, what? I said, ha, 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 ha. just, you know, kicked the table leg. And uh, God, it was hacking me, you know, on the shins. And when I went out, I looked at him and he went, <laughs> best boss I ever had, you know, because he had the guts to do it. But he, what was nice, he took the rough with the smooth, <coughs> which is what you really need, is to run and say, look, I'd rather you get rid of that, but let's not get rid of that and lose all this <laughs> differentiating. And, uh, you know, I was a great husband. <laughs> By my reckoning, I was, you know. She lived at home in a five-bedroom house, and uh, I still didn't stop me doing the hoovering. But she was a perfectionist, which didn't go down with me at all, so I did the hoovering. And she said, did you do that bit by the wardrobe in the second bedroom? <laughs> <laughs> my name's just saying, you know, and I'm in the spare bedroom, I haven't had any for years. You know. <laughs> I'm having to cut up with this. And then um, I'd be packing in the supermarket, which I did religiously every week, you know. I mean, some blokes wouldn't even know where Sainsbury's is, let alone do the packing. But there I am diligently doing the packing, and I'd get this... <sighs> I don't know how many more times I have to tell you not to put the bloody bleach in with the food. <laughs> well, it's all sealed, you know. Yes, but it's easy to unpack at the other end. When I know where it is, I said, but I'm doing the unpacking. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see it was a marriage made in heaven in that respect. <laughs> Nothing to do with bipolar, actually. That's how I've rationalised it. But, yeah. but do you think your bipolar played a part in putting up with it because you didn't feel that you were able to walk because some of it was your responsibility. Does that make sense? It does exactly make sense. I don't mean, yeah, exactly. You mean I cut too much slack? <laughs> Instead of saying after about two years, you really are a cow. Yes. Um, I, I actually said, no, darling, I'm going to step back from that because it's clearly me. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. No, I do. I, you're right. Probably it does, yeah, because I'm not. The book's there, but I mean, if you read it, I think it's a fair account. You know, I tried, wanted to be fair, which is, she doesn't come out of it very well, but I think the person who comes out of that book worst, undoubtedly, is me. You know, I've used the term loads and things like that. You remember reading it, you know. So I'm, I, but it, I think people could do a lot more to understand than, than they do, maybe. They haven't got it, you know, they don't get their heads around it. Maybe it's something as well in the northern part of the world, isn't it? You know, get a grip. I mean, my dad had it, but, you know, we'd never have accepted it. He got it. Oh, don't talk bloody ridiculous. Psychiatrist, you're off your head. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm there, Dad. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know so... Um, any other sort of things I can... Whatever you like, I mean, I don't you know. It's there for the game. You said you uh, rejected sort of the psychiatrists yeah. and that sort of help. Did you find help in any other form? Any kind of... You know, different sort of support, which you felt. Like you said again that as a man, you might find it difficult to look for support. Mm -hmm. But was there anywhere that you did find support that was helpful? Um, not really. No, I think it's come latterly by writing a book and getting a lot of Twitter followers, a lot of whom are interested in mental illness, <coughs> and doing blogs and people writing to me. A lot of people write to me that. It's helped on two levels. One, I, I enjoy helping somebody else, which is something I, I wasn't very... I'm pretty selfish. Um, just about me, 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 and, and not giving much, and always admiring people who did give up time and things like that. And I found myself doing it and getting a lot of pleasure out of it, but also, I'm sure a lot of people in here feel that way, that you suddenly count your blessings, I think, was a discussion we had, because you start to think, crikey, I think I've got it bad today, you know, compared to what this person's had to go through. Um, so it helps me realising that my condition is, you know, I'd rather not have it, but frankly, I'm, per I'm in a totally the wrong position with the camera, aren't I? Sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's a disaster, but never mind, you know. I've got a lovely voice, that's the thing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I think it's, 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 it's just a swine of a condition, really, you, you know, and, and you, I, I, 
I've got to grips with it, but I, I'll never really get on top of it. I sort of manage it, but I've stopped fighting it, I think is the thing. I've stopped trying to just cure it and look at it or whatever. I just realise it, it is what it is. I've got to figure out to find a way around it. Do you think this is your therapy? This helps, yeah, definitely, yeah. Because I've stopped being embarrassed about it. I get a lot of men writing to me saying, fantastic, they go overboard saying, I can't believe you're talking about it. You know, I, we should be burying this. And then they say, no, I don't mean that. It's just that I'm so embarrassed to, you know, feel I'm mentally ill. Whereas the women are much more open. So a lot of men are really keen that, you know, you open up. Uh, and it's perverse, isn't it? Because apparently there's more male suicides than female suicides. So there's perversity of statistics that women are much more willing to sort of address it and deal with it. Whereas men sort of... Blah, blah, blah. And it's of course masculine, isn't it? You know, you, you don't try. Uh, you don't do this, you don't do that. So yes, yeah, by accident, you know, it's worked for me because it's given me some sort of focus. And... Uh, and I can talk about it in a positive way rather than feeling sorry for myself, um, which is, I think, quite important. Mm -hmm. Is the stigma attaching to mental illness any less today than it was 20 years ago? No. I don't think so. Do no, I think it's the last bastion of stigma, actually. Right. Right. Um, back to that, you know, it, it, simply somebody leaves because somebody's got a crop leg. And they're in a wheelchair, that's, yeah. well, I can't believe, you know, that she would do that or he would do that. She'd be, what about marriage vows? But mental illness, adios. Mm -hmm. And that's why you've got to get out of that relationship. Um, and uh, you get a lot of people, uh, I think friends will counsel people away from somebody who's got mentally ill. They won't turn around and say, make it work, find a way around it. They'll just say, get the hell out of there. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I think it's a big stigma, yeah. I think it's in the language. And I admit it, I call somebody a fruit loop. Yeah. Or in that case, or whatever, I've done it, um, and I am one, right, in that sense, you know. Uh, so it's a bit uh, pot calling the kettle black or whatever, but yeah, I think that it's the language that's used now. Um, and I think we've seen the language change, haven't we? You know, the sort of uh, uh, homophobic type language has been changing, <coughs> the disabilities in the Olympics, but there's a, it's, it's far from perfect, but it's, it's taken a big step over here. And the same with racism, there's still racists out there and so on, but I think with mental health, um, I did a, a blog on that just saying that when people say I'm not a racist, that usually means they are, um, in my experience. So I'm not a racist. Yes, you are, because you would have said it otherwise. You don't even make a statement if, if, if you've done that. And I think with mental health, people say, oh, no, I'm pretty good, but they're not. Um, I think some people think they're going to get contaminated by it. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're with you and you're bipolar, you can see clear at him, you know. It could be a mass murderer, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's when you walk in with sort of garlic round the throat, you know, bearing a cross. You know. um, so, no, I don't. Yeah. When you're really hyper, or when you're really down, yeah. let's just take one or the other. Yeah. Is there any one person who could, that you can think of that could help you at that time? And if so, what might they say and do? Or is there no way that anybody can get through to what's going on in your head? They could if they take the time, rather than maybe they get into a default position of, oh, here we go again, yeah. and they don't think it through. I, when I'm hyper, I really don't want any help. Because no. I think I'm master of the universe and I'm omnipotent. And uh, the best film I've ever seen of it, I, I have to say, I've not seen the Silver Linings playbook, people say that's very good. But there was one that was very good with, with Mr. Jones about 20 years ago with Richard Gere where it starts off with him, you know, on a building so he can be Superman, and I've had that feeling, where you feel completely omnipotent. I can tell when I'm going hyper, because I'm aware I start talking quickly. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking quickly now, but believe me, when I start talking quickly. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's just incomprehensible. When well, the press an accent, um, you know, it's in a foreign language as well. I didn't realise you were like Did you not really? No, no. You all told it against me. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, so, you don't think even if you trusted somebody implicitly, that you could actually listen and be, and, and have a, could, that person, could that person possibly have an impact as you're going really hyper or not? Or is it just something that has to take its course? I think it, I would say it's more diverting me. If you can divert me into something where the hyperness becomes something positive. Right. Um, like doing, let, let's, you know, you can see it coming with me, so even before I get there you can see it coming, so maybe you know, let's go out, go down and do something today, and go mountaineering, you've got bags in there, don't say anything, just divert them and wear me out energy-wise or something. 
And if you're in depression, I don't want sympathy and I don't really want understanding. I want diverting from it. It's, it's diverting me out of it, getting change that mindset. If I can't do it, it's just uh, sort of saying, oh, darling, you're going to get your tea. Are you okay? I don't want that. If I get that, I'll wallow in it even more um, and make a real meal of it. Um, so I'd rather be diverted and do something uh, crazy. I mean, I don't take me to the casino, obviously, when I'm hiding. Uh, if you do, hide the credit cards and just give me $100, you know. Um, uh, but yeah, di divert diverting someone, I think it's changing the conversation. So finding something different uh, to talk about. I mean, it's quite interesting, one of my big followers, you know, um, Les Battersby, do you remember him? Yeah. He's one of my big followers now. <coughs> He's got a one-man show, he went depressed and, and uh, lost his, all his earnings and everything, lives in Colwyn Bay. He's doing a one-man show now. Uh, and uh, I've got uh, another one who follows me and... Uh, it's, uh, what's her name? Sinead O'Connor? Mm -hmm. She's, you know, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, if I'm bipolar, she's sort of, you know, in, in block capital, yeah. <laughs> and admits it now. I mean, uh, so it's quite a lot of people, it's quite a good network that way. And it does make you feel a bit better. Um, but often they are quite sort of creative and they've done some special things, but over here, you know, they just, the wheels fall apart. She got it, apparently, it came out of postpartum depression. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, that's what, that, I think that's the way it sort of, that's what seemed to be the trigger. <coughs> Maybe some hormonal shift. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, it's quite an interesting community, but I think it's diverting. Or the, 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 the Les Battersby, I forget his name, Bruce Jones, I think is his name, the actor. But he's, um, like me, doing a one-man show and actually now trying to be open about it and get us some joy out of sharing it. And instead of trying to deny it, it is what it is. You know, I've lost everything through drunkenness and, and depression. And he's trying to switch it around. And you've got to take your hat off to him. But I think it's changing that conversation and <coughs> switching them out. A bit like you do with distracting kids, to be honest with you. You know, when you're little kids and you just want to distract them, instead of saying, don't do that, often the best way in conflict is to get them involved in something else. If you want a bit of peace, you know, when, uh, when you're having a meal, is take a training set when they're five or six years old. It's that training, give them that, and away they go. But if you keep saying, don't do that, you know, for the minute they think, oh, wow, something better than off here, and they're suddenly quiet. And I think it's the same with, with my condition, is somehow help me switch into something else. Think about something, say, do you remember we said we were going to do that? I really fancy doing that today. Oh, and, come on, come on, you know, get your arse in here. Let's go out and do something. And suddenly you find it's maybe snatched you back before you, you drop into it. But I think empathy isn't that helpful. Because um, it's not really, it's fine to empathize, but it's not changing anything. Um, so, if, so if you or someone else found Samaritans and was explaining to us that uh, you were bipolar, yeah. how is, what is the best way that we can help wow. in that circumstance? <coughs> Pull yourself together, Jackson. <laughs> yeah. Well, quite clearly, um, the first thing you must do is direct them to Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> now we get down to the real purpose of this meeting. Yes. Yes. So we can all go there exactly. Sell the book. Um, yeah. uh, I, I would, I would turn around and say, well, you're in good company. And if they sort of give me and say, well, there's six million registered with a buy program in the US, so you're not a persecuted minority. Uh, and there's over a million with it apparently in the UK. Um, there are more people diagnosed with depression and, and so on than there are with lots of other things. So you're not quite as alone as you think. Um, does that make me feel better? Yeah, it makes me feel a bit better, the six million of us out there. Now, I'm sure there's loads of wrong diagnoses out there. Some people were not, and doctors are dying in the distance. But it's got to be at least three million out of the six, and that's a lot of people who've got it. And if you look at it around the world, um, then it's it's just we just view life slightly differently. It's just having slightly different glasses on. It doesn't make you a criminal, but your brain just isn't quite wired uh, the same way as someone else. Um, but you know, not to feel bad about it. It's just you know you've got the short straw, but there's plenty of people who've got bigger short straw. I do worry about that bloke or the woman who said who's no one's worse off than them. You know, when somebody says, there's always someone worse off than you, you think, well, who's the person who no one is worse <laughs> off than them? <laughs> yes. And if they are, for goodness sake, tell me, because yes. I don't have anywhere near the results. Um, and there are, there are, there are degrees. Um, 
I'm really sorry about the camera work. I apologise. You know, it's bipolar. You know, just, there's something I just have to stand here. It's the way the confluence of the sort of, you know, the zone and everything that comes in. If I'm over here, I just feel a bit out of it. You know, over here I go hyper, and over there I start to feel depressed. So this is my middle position, and that's a pathetic excuse for uh, for, for whatever. So are we coming to a drawing to a close? Any final questions? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm selling books. Um, all the proceeds tonight, I'm, I'm happy to give to the, the Samaritans. Uh, they're, they're, I think you do a great job, you guys. So hats off to all of you uh, and anyone else and other uh, charities and things like that. So uh, if you want to do it, all the proceeds are not going in my pocket. Um, all I would ask you to do is read it and say it's the best book you've ever read. <laughs> <laughs> and if you tell ten people that, it's ten people, you know, yes. um, I'll come back in a year in my Ferrari and uh, tell you I'm no longer dirt poor and uh, things are really improved. Anyway, yes. thanks very much. <laughs>